Thank you uh, for having me again this year. Um, I just realized when Bob was reading out the, uh, the biography, I've actually been at Princess Margaret Cancer Center now, including my training year, for 10 years. So it's, uh, it's a long time to be at the same place, but I guess if you find meaning in the work you do, it's a place that you would love to keep going back to every day. So thank you again for having me this year. And as Bob was saying, um, I'll be talking about fatigue in cancer patients. So a few objectives I hope to achieve today with uh, the talk really want to describe what cancer-related fatigue and the causes of it is. We'll talk a little bit about any self-management strategies that you can use, and also if there are any medications as well that can help treat the fatigue. So maybe I'll start off with asking you guys, when I say the word fatigue, what comes to your mind? Exhaustion. Exhaustion. Any other words? Uh, mental confusion. Mental confusion. Low endurance. Low endurance. Low stamina. Mm -hmm. Those are all great words. In fact, a lot of people, when they think of fatigue, they think of all these different things. And it can be confusing when we talk about how to manage fatigue. What does that mean? Is it that I'm physically tired with low stamina, I can't do much physically, or I get tired easily? Or does it mean that I want to fall asleep all the time, I'm drowsy? Or is it that my mind is not working as sharply as it used to, that mental clouding or the poor concentration? So you'll see that there are these words that a lot of people would use almost interchangeably, but they actually do mean something slightly different. So fatigue really, in simpler terms, is just feeling tired or exhausted. Whereas drowsy is the feeling of wanting to fall asleep perhaps uncontrollably. So you can feel tired, but not drowsy. And finally, you can also have that mental clouding uh, or brain fog, as some people would call it. I want to share with you a, uh, an official definition, and this is from the States, from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And they define cancer-related fatigue, or CRF, as a distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, and or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related to cancer or cancer treatment that is not proportional to recent activity and interferes with usual functioning. I think that's a great definition, a great summary of how it affects patients because it affects not just the physical body but also your feelings, your emotions, your cognition, so your ability to think and plan and do things, and it makes you feel exhausted, and can be related to the cancer, so the illness itself, or the treatment for the illness. The big thing too is it's out of keeping of what you would expect for the amount of effort you put in. You feel a lot more tired than you would expect. And probably the most important piece is that it affects people's ability to function. But you may ask the question, then why does it matter? Why is it important to me as a myeloma patient or a cancer patient or to family or caregivers of a cancer patient? Well, it's because it's a very common problem and it's a big problem. So 80% of cancer patients who are on their chemotherapy or radiation treatment say they feel tired and they have fatigue. Of those who are getting treatment right now, almost half of them, 45%, say that they have moderate to severe fatigue. So that's a difficulty that they have to deal with every day, and it certainly would affect how they function. And even people who are survivors, so meaning they finished their treatment, from breast, prostate, colorectal, or lung cancers, about a third of them say they still have fatigue. I'm sorry I don't have any numbers specific to the myeloma group, um, just because research in fatigue in general 
has been sort of lacking in that perspective. But I did manage to find one study from Britain where they looked at a small group, very small group, less than 50 patients. Half of them had lymphoma and half of them had myeloma. And of those patients, um, they were all male patients and they were a bit older, older than 63. But again, a third of them with myeloma say that they feel tired. So it is a real problem for all kinds of cancer, certainly for myeloma patients. And importantly, the patients say that it affects their ability to look after themselves. They have difficulty dressing themselves, bathing themselves, getting out of bed, eating, doing the things that they normally would need to do to function. But also, they cannot do the leisure activities, things that they enjoy. They cannot do the social activities. Even if they have wanted to go out and meet friends and families, their tiredness prevent them from doing so. So as you can see, more than 90% of patients actually say they cannot lead a normal life because of how tired and exhausted they feel. And if you look at people who are trying to get back to work after they finish their treatment uh, or while they're doing treatment, the average is people would have to miss about four days every month from work just because they cannot bring themselves to go into the office simply because they're so tired. The other big thing about pro the fatigue problem is it's also not usually recognized, both by the healthcare providers like myself or by patients or their families. And it certainly is underreported by patients. They don't tell their doctors or nurses enough that they feel tired and it prevents them from doing what they need to do. And because of that, it's undertreated. Perhaps people could have felt better, but because they didn't recognize that this is a problem. They didn't think they should tell their doctors or nurses, or the doctors and nurses didn't feel that they need to ask the patients, how are you doing with your energy? Many people feel that fatigue is actually the most distressing symptom with cancer or its treatment. Way worse than pain, shortness of breath, or other symptoms. So that's why it is an important issue that we should tackle today. But why does fatigue happen? Why do we feel so low with our energy? There are actually many, many causes. Most obviously, it's the cancer itself, so different types of cancer. And we don't exactly know how, but some of the theory behind that is when people have cancer, the body goes into a very uh, inflammatory state. And there are these signals, these chemicals in our body called cytokines that sort of tell the body to function in a way that makes you feel really, really tired. But we also know treatments from the cancer can also make people feel tired. And it doesn't matter which type of treatment we're talking about, all of them, unfortunately, can cause tiredness. So chemotherapy, certainly, because it makes the bone marrow sluggish. Um, and there are other side effects like nausea or vomiting that makes people tired. The radiation patients may get can do the same thing to the bone marrow. Immunotherapy, that's a, a newer type of treatment that's happening. Um, we're also recognizing that can also cause tiredness, just like chemo and radiation. Now, some of this is the physical type of fatigue, but chemotherapy in particular have been known to affect the cognitive function of brain. Um, so we call it a chemo brain phenomenon. Uh, a lot of the studies come out from breast cancer patients just because traditionally they've been the ones who lived the longest from their treatment. So we are starting to recognize that patients who survive their treatment, even long after they finish their treatment, have a lot of problem with memory, with concentration, with attention, and we call that chemo brain. And certainly if you had different types of treatment combined together, you get the, the worst, right? You get a double, triple, or even quadruple whammy as a result of that. Now, mood is another big thing. We know patients with chronic illness, cancer including, can have issues with their mood. They can feel either sad or depressed, or they could be feeling anxious or worried. And these emotions can also make people feel tired. Other problems that happens in cancer patients is one thing called anorexia cachexia syndrome. And that's when the body um, from that inf inflammatory component that we were talking about earlier keeps on losing weight and not able to maintain an interest in food, doesn't want to eat. 
And as the person gets more tired and, and thinner and weaker, it compounds the problem that they've been experiencing from cancer or the treatment. And of course, patients who are generally malnourished or dehydrated can feel very tired. The next thing is your physical condition. Bob mentioned the feeling of low stamina. So when your body is not in good shape physically, you can also have more tiredness. In fact, some of the study tells us when patients say they are not very active physically, their tiredness is worse and it lasts longer. So already it gives us a hint at how we can fix that. And we'll mention that later on. Um, of course, if you have a bodily or organic reason for not being able to do a lot of physical activity, you can also feel tired. So if you have any problem with your nerves, with your muscles, with your heart, with your lungs, all of these things that you require to, to um, stay physically fit or active, then it would make you feel more tired as well. Unfortunately, sometimes we do it to the patients. The medications that we prescribe can also make people feel tired because of their side effects. So from my line of work, helping to manage symptoms, um, the things that I prescribe like pain medication, medications to prevent or treat anxiety, to treat depression, to prevent or treat nausea, they can also make patients feel tired. Now the next thing that people tell us also is that they can't sleep very well. In fact, we know almost 100% of cancer patients have some sort of sleep problem throughout the course of their illness. They can either feel very, very sleepy, so what we call hypersomnolence, or that they have problem falling asleep, insomnia. So either end of the extremes are not great, and that compounds the problem of tiredness. Besides sleep problem, other symptoms, if they're not managed well, can also make people feel tired. So if you're in pain all the time, if you feel nauseous, if you feel short of breath, it would make you very exhausted, even just to do simple things. And then finally, what we call psychosocial factors, things that have to do with the person's um, surrounding and their environment and the context that they live in. Now, again, these are mostly based out of the breast cancer populations because they have the most experience having survived the treatment. But we found that in this group, having a partner seemed to prevent uh, tiredness or fatigue. Now, we don't know why. This is just what we call an association. It could be because having a partner is a great thing. There's someone to look after you. There's someone to do certain things for you. Maybe they're a good advocate for you to mention your issues to your healthcare team. Or maybe they're a great motivator or life coach getting you back on your feet. We don't know what is the actual secret ingredient that works, but we do know having a partner is a good thing in this case. There may be other instances where you think maybe it's not worth the risk to have a partner in my life. I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> Another thing, though, that um, a lot of people found in the research is, uh, interestingly, for people who are not able to come to acceptance in the moment that they have an incurable illness, um, their fatigue lasts longer and is worse. So it speaks a little bit about that mind over body piece. Now again, this applies only to people with an incurable cancer. So for some people, it may not be appropriate. Um, the one last concept that sometimes we as a doctor has to think about is this possibility called malingering, meaning some patients pretend that they have fatigue or tiredness because there's something to gain from that. Maybe they don't need to get back to the work that they don't want to. Maybe they can claim insurance, etc. cetera. Um, but that happens in real life, and we have to be sort of smart and be mindful that that can occur. So when you as a patient or family brings up the issue of tiredness to your healthcare team, these are all the different things that go through our mind. What it is, what is it that is causing the tiredness in this person's life? How can we fix it if there are things that are fixable? What will help with fatigue now, I'm going to divide this section into two parts. Patients who are currently doing their treatment for the cancer and then patients who are done with their treatment now and they're what we call a survivor. So starting with patients who are currently on their treatment, what can help with their tiredness? Uh, well, the big thing actually is letting people know that this will happen when they get on treatment. So education or counseling. Uh, 
Sometimes, as we said, a lot of the treatments have the expected side effect of tiredness, and it's helpful to warn people up front that this is what they may be faced with. The importance of that is because it decreases the fear that maybe my treatment is not working when I feel tired. There are some patients who, who think that, right? When they feel really tired more than the usual, they wonder, does it, does it mean that my treatment is not working? Or another fear they may have is that, is my disease getting worse? And because of this fear, some patients actually don't tell their healthcare team that they have fatigue. So that's why if we do our job as a healthcare provider to let you guys know that this is something you can expect, it may help establish a better, more open communication channel for us in case fatigue does come up as a problem. And this is where, um, from a lot of cancer societies, the suggestion for patients or their family is to keep a log, keep a treatment diary. How are you feeling from day to day? What are, what are you doing? Um, so that you can see if there's any pattern to your tiredness. What makes it better? What makes it worse? What time of the day, or even in the week, do I have the best amount of energy? And after you know that pattern, you can use this strategy called energy conservation. It's exactly as I said, you're trying to save your energy for things that you like to do, that you enjoy doing, and those that are important to you. So in fact, when people come to me about their complaints of tiredness, I suggest to them, why don't you make a list of things that you like to do, starting from the most important and most enjoyable down to the least important and least enjoyable. So, on a day when your energy is good, then you start from the top of the list and get things done so you can actually feel accomplished. And things that you don't get to, they're not as important anyway, so we don't have to worry about them. We'll try again on another day. And this is also where consulting an occupational therapist could be helpful. So an occupational therapist or an OT, the job is to help patients find meaningful activities, things that they like to do but also to help them come up with ways to do it in an energy efficient way or a safe way so that people can stay active and comfortable and as well safe. And they'll probably tell a lot of patients, you need to take breaks. A lot of people, when they feel tired, the inclination or the instinct is to just power through it because that's something I used to be able to do. Well, I think we have to take a bit of a pause to remind ourselves when you're going through treatment, it's okay to feel tired and it's okay to take a break. You do not have to force yourself to overdo it. Because what happens is if you overdo it, unfortunately, is you get so exhausted that you're out of commission for the next little while and you wouldn't be able to manage all the things that you hope to achieve. So taking breaks, pacing yourself, listening to your body is very important. And the suggestion is if you need to take a nap in order to feel refreshed, you can do so, but maybe set an alarm so it's not more than an hour in the day. Because as we mentioned, sleep disturbances is very common in cancer patients. So if your sleep cycle is disrupted because you took too long a nap during the day, then you can imagine you're not going to fall asleep as easily or that when you fall asleep at night, it's not going to be as good or as restoring a sleep. And that would feed back into the daytime tiredness. So conserving your energy, taking the time to plan your activity, getting some help from the OT if needed, and just doing it slowly and gradually. Also, people have noticed what they call distraction therapies could be helpful. And distraction therapy could be things like reading, listening to music, or doing some things that actually take your mind off the tiredness. Interestingly, when your mind is focused on doing something, it's actually better at sort of rallying and finding energy reserve that you didn't even know existed when you feel so tired. So those are good, easy things you can try and start on your own. But there may be another level where you need a little bit of extra help in doing physical activity, especially if you feel kind of tired with low stamina, low endurance. Well, the good news is the physical activity that would help you feel less tired it's only what we call light to moderate intensity or light to moderate level. So things like walking is good enough. And it doesn't even need to be like brisk walking where you break out sweat. You don't need to. Just getting up from sitting, it's a helpful thing. 
So I always tell people, any activity counts. Anything is better than nothing. So listen to your body. The caveat to that is right now with the amount of research we have, we're not able to recommend a specific time frame or number of minutes that people need to achieve in a week while they're on treatment. The flip side to that is, you know, you can do whatever you can and that still counts. However, in myeloma patients, I think we all recognize that there may be a risk with bony involvement and the, the, the harm of fracturing or breaking up bone. So this is where having a physiotherapist or what we call a physical rehabilitation specialist could be helpful because they can assess what you can do based on the context of the illness, where your, your myeloma is, and then design for you a personalized exercise program that you can achieve. And they can challenge you sort of appropriately and gradually increase the intensity or the duration. And that's really it. As you start to get more physically active, you may notice that your endurance and your stamina improve. And when that happens, you can start to gradually increase the time. For example, I would maybe tell my patient who's very, very tired, currently going through the treatment, to just maybe schedule five minutes of activity to start in the day, in the morning, and then maybe add that to the afternoon, and then to the evening. And when they can manage that quite well, they can start to increase from five minutes to 10 minutes with each block. So they get like 30 minutes, for example, gradually over a period of a few weeks. And the secret is, is the benefit is the same whether you've done it in one long stretch or if you've bro broken it up into smaller chunks. So if you were able to do 30 minutes of walking, but then you get very exhausted, it gives you the same benefit as if you've done three of 10 minute walks or five, uh, six five minute walks. So if you know that your limit is 15 minutes, after the 15 minutes, I'm so tired, I need to take a break so that I can get my breathing under control or that you know, I, I just can't go on anymore because of pain, then don't go over the 15 minutes, do 10 minutes maximum but do more times of it so that eventually you still get the same amount of benefit in the whole day. And for some patients, it may be helpful if they get connected to a dietitian to help with any nutritional issue. As we said, if a person is malnourished or dehydrated, sometimes it compounds the problem with their tiredness. So maybe having a dietitian to recommend the right diet or make changes so that you can actually get the most of your nutrition, that could be helpful. And then if you have sleep problems, this is where maybe your doctors and nurses can help you with that. There's a, a group of therapy called sleep therapy, but it actually includes many things um, from the very simple suggestions of you know, avoiding caffeine or you know, turning off your iPads or your tablets an hour before bedtime. So those good habits, what we call sleep hygiene habits, to something a little bit more intensive where you do uh, cognitive behavioral therapy specifically, so you manage your bedtime. Um, and these things, you know, may not be appropriate for everyone, but if you talk to a specialist, they can suggest to you the things that would work the best for you. And all these things are things you can do at home. So we mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy, and actually there's a good amount of research to say this works very well in, in terms of helping with fatigue from cancer. What happens is a lot of people, once they get tired, doing certain things, the brain becomes too smart for its own good and learn that you shouldn't go and do that same activity again. So it becomes a bit of a downward spiral. You start to avoid those activities. Even if your body is actually recovering and managed to handle them, your, your mind is telling you, oh no, I can't really do that. So this is where CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is helpful. It helps to retrain the, the brain, retrain the mind in approaching things from a different way. Another group of therapy that's been studied a lot is what we call psychoeducational therapy. And this is where uh, it could be a psychologist, could be a psychiatrist uh, who's helping patients to develop stress uh, management skills, coping skills, and helping to give them support. It could be in a one-on-one -on -one setting or it could be in a group-like setting. And all these things have been proven to work really well to help treat tiredness. 
What hasn't been so great in research is just what they call supportive expressive therapy. And that's when people do journaling or they do group chats and things like that. Um, those have been shown to be helpful for some people, but not for everyone. So for now, I think we can, we can say there's probably no harm in doing those things, but we just don't know how good it will work for you. If it's something that you feel up to, that you're interested in doing, that's certainly a reasonable thing to try. And then we come to things that we actually don't have enough research to say, yeah, you should do it. And those are things like acupuncture, yoga, and massage. Um, these are, again, things that are relatively low harm, but also we haven't been able to find in research that they definitively make people feel better about their energy. And especially, again, in the myeloma group, with their bone health and the risk of fracture, we have to be careful when we think about yoga and massage therapy. There's certain things, certain um, positions uh, or maneuvers that perhaps are not appropriate or maybe not even safe. And this is again where you can ask your physician or nurses to double check before you engage in these therapies. So what if none of these things are good enough for my energy? then maybe this is when we have to think about medications. So unfortunately, I have to say the spoiler alert is not many medications work for tiredness in cancer. The biggest one that's been talked about a lot in research is what we call methylphenidate, or you probably know its brand name, Ritalin. Have many of you heard of that? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nods, yeah. You probably heard of Ritalin in the context of for children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right, ADHD. And it is true that that's a uh, treatment for that particular condition. But there's also research done in adult patients with cancer who complain of tiredness. And it's been found that for some situations, Ritalin can be helpful, methylphenidate could work. The problem though is the research that's been done had been done on so many different groups of patients, different types of cancers, while they're on treatment, while they're just finishing treatment. Um, it's just a, a bit too much of a mixed uh, group. So then the results are also mixed. The good thing we know though, especially from my work, um, our clinical experience show that if someone were to try the methylphenidate, the Ritalin, if it's gonna work for them, it works very quickly. Like within the same day or the next day, you'll know that it's making a difference. So that's a good thing, at least. If we were to try it and it works, you'll know right away. Or if it doesn't work, then the doctors will also know that maybe this is something we shouldn't continue, we can just stop. The common side effects for methylphenidate or Ritalin is because it gives people energy or makes them feel a little bit more alert, sometimes it's effect is sleep. But that's also why we suggest taking that first thing in the morning so you get the energy or the oomph that you need in the daytime when you need to use that energy, but it wouldn't affect your sleep. The other side effect is because it makes people feel a little bit more activated, if you have a problem with anxiety to begin with, it sometimes makes it a bit worse. But this is something that you, know, you can work with your doctor to monitor. And finally, patients complain about a dry mouth with it as well. And unfortunately, there isn't a good fix for that other than keeping up with your fluids. But the current guidelines from several cancer societies actually do say methylphenidate or Ritalin is perhaps the best medication or maybe even the only medication that's been proven in the most times, although not all times, to be helpful for fatigue due to cancer and its treatment. There is another medication that is mentioned because people have done research on it called modafinil. It's also a stimulant like methylphenidate, but it works in a different way, except we don't know how it works. And that's why in research, we've only seen mixed results. It looks like people who have the worst cases of fatigue seem to find it the most helpful, which kind of makes sense. If its effect is not very strong, maybe that's why you can only notice it when people are really tired to begin with. The problem though for a lot of patients is it's not covered by our provincial drug benefit. So it can be quite expensive to the point that people cannot afford it. So I have not actually used it a lot with my patients. Side effects are very similar to the methylphenidate and or Ritalin. Now the final 
thing I want to talk about for patients who are currently on their treatment when they complain of tiredness is not a medication, but a, what we would call a supplement. Uh, this is something called Wisconsin ginseng. Uh, the interest in it came about because some cultures actually use ginseng a lot as a, as a herbal supplement. And people have thought maybe it, it does give people a little bit more energy. So some scientists have actually started doing research on it. So the research that's been done so far seems promising in that patients who have tiredness do start to feel better. Um, it doesn't work very quickly in the, in the research studies. Typically, it kicks in after the, the first month. So you have to be on it for quite a while. and You have to take it every day for it to be really helpful for you. But for the duration that they were looking at these patients, and in total it was two months, those people who found it helpful continue to find it helpful at the end of that two-month period. Now, we don't know what happens after the two months because they weren't followed anymore. But the early result seems promising. And some people are now, some scientists are now starting to do combination research where they put patients on the Wisconsin ginseng with the Ritalin to see, you know, does it actually work even better when you put the two together in combination. So I think we should wait for more research to, to guide us. Um, the other thing I want to make a comment on is, you know, Wisconsin ginseng being a supplement is what we would consider a natural health product. So it's not a medication per se, which means um, Health Canada does not regulate it. It does not check in on its producer, does not make sure that it's made in the same way every time. So that's the caveat for any natural health product when you buy them you know, without a prescription. You never quite know what's in the bottle. When the bottle says Wisconsin ginseng, is it really? You don't know. And if they say 500 milligram in each capsule, is it actually 500 milligram or is it something else? You don't know as well. So that's the caveat to that as well. And then going on to the, the last section, because I'm mindful that we may need to take a break soon. We're talking about how to help patients with tiredness when they're done with their treatment. Now they're recovering after all the treatment is over, what happens if they still feel tired? Well, a lot of the things we talked about earlier still apply, so the education and the counseling can still make a difference. But here, we're talking about that we can expect the tiredness to gradually improve now that the treatment is done, especially because we think a lot of the side effects, uh, a lot of the tiredness is actually a side effect of the treatment. However, it can be a highly variable course from person to person. Everyone is a bit different. How you respond to the treatment may be different from the person sitting next to you, even if you had gotten the same treatment. And of course, if you had gotten different treatments, your recovery can be different as well. So this is where I think our job as a healthcare provider is important to reassess regularly to see where is this person at with their recovery. Are they getting better with their energy? in the expected time frame, or are things still not happening fast enough? And if that's the case, what may be going on? And this is where we go back to that long list of causes that we talked about earlier. Have we missed some, something from before? Is it something that we have done, like we have we prescribed a medication that maybe you don't need anymore now that you're done with the treatment? Perhaps that medication side effect is making you tired and we can stop that medication now. So this is where that ongoing dialogue with your healthcare team is very helpful and important. And again, continuing of the energy conservation strategies and staying physically active. Now, in the patient group that's completed their treatment, there are actual recommendations from the Cancer Society guidelines. So there's a goal that we can try and achieve gradually. So the recommendation is to have 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise. So that means fast walking, swimming, um, you know, on the treadmill or elliptical, that sort of things. Plus, so in addition to that, two to three sessions of strength training like weight lifting or resistant band a week. Now you say, well, that's perhaps quite a lot. If, especially earlier, I was saying anything is good, you know, you don't have to push yourself too hard. So this is really a goal to work towards and how you get there should be individualized. So. If you find that you can get there fast enough, that's great. But if you, if you think you cannot, don't worry about it. And don't push yourself too hard because otherwise there, there can be a risk of injury. And this is again where having a physiotherapist or a rehab specialist to meet with you could be helpful. 
Um, for example, at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, we actually, from our survivorship center, we have a program where we have a physiatrist, so a physical rehab specialist, so a doctor with training in that, a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, and a kinesiologist, so a movement specialist, who work together with our patients to assess what they can do, find out their goals, how active do they want to be, what do they want to achieve, and help them create a personalized plan. And sometimes it could be things that they do in that gym for the survivorship clinic, or other times they get referred to external centers or external programs where they can continue with that rehab gradually. Now the cognitive behavioral therapy, psychoeducational therapy, and supportive expressive, supportive expressive therapy that we talked about earlier actually works better in this group of people who have finished their treatment. So these are certainly things that people can pursue. And then again, if we have to, we can consider medication. However, for people who have completed the treatment, methylphenidate or Ritalin is not something that we would necessarily consider unless we make sure that other causes have been ruled out. So for patients who have completed the treatment, the methylphenidate is something that we would only consider almost as a last resort. Like we've looked at all the other possible causes and um, we're pretty sure that we haven't found anything that we can fix. So now the only thing we can do then is to minimize the symptom by giving them the stimulant. In this case, modafinil as a medication is actually not recommended. So this final slide is talking about something that I found as I was doing my research for this talk. Um, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of research on tiredness for myeloma patients. Most of the research have been done on different types of cancers, um, but not myeloma. But I found this study that's being done, and it's actually from Canada, which is also even better, uh, and it's being done by a group of physiotherapists. They're looking at all the um, research studies and guidelines that's out there so that they can formulate something that's supported by science, saying these are the things that a physiotherapist can do to support myeloma patients from getting better uh, with their fatigue. So hopefully um, this will come uh, in the next, I would say, one to two years, because right now in 2018, they are just building the protocol for their, for their guidelines review. So maybe uh, in a year or two, someone will come back to talk to you about how this works for you guys to help you stay physically active and fit. And with that, I am done with my part. I'm sure you all want a coffee break at this point. Welcome back. I guess um, this is a time where if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask. Um, just a reminder that this is a, uh, a talk for sort of pu public education and general health information. So I'll try not to comment on your specific individual um, illness uh, decisions or things like that because I think it's most important that you talk to your physician who knows your history, who knows your condition the best. Um, and if anything I said during this talk is a bit different from your, what your doctor is recommending, make sure you go back and, and speak to your doctor and go by your doctor's recommendations always. Hi, Dave. What about coffee? So the question is, is coffee okay? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> I think just by the nature of me having that picture up, right? Um, I think uh, we talked about, I was uh, talking to someone during the break about sleep problem. And as we mentioned earlier, sleep can contribute to the fatigue issue. So anything that can interfere with sleep, including caffeine, is something we need to consider carefully. Now, it's not to say that you should not use any or consume any ca caffeine, but obviously moderation is key and also the timing of it. So if you know that drinking caffeine too late in the day will keep you up and you can't sleep, so now you're tired the next day, then it's something to avoid. But in general, caffeine should be fine. Uh, whether or not it can be used as a treatment for fatigue, I think it depends on the person. Um, there are some people who respond you know, very sensitively to caffeine, uh, and then other people who, you know, downing three cups of coffee does nothing to them. So I think it's very individual. Um, 
technically, I, I guess we shouldn't really be considering caffeine as a treatment for fatigue, but certainly it's something to help improve your quality of life. And if it gives you a bit of zing in the, in the daytime, so you can do the things that you need, uh, by all means. So the question, uh, there are two questions actually. The first question is about steroid. Um, as many of you are on steroids and when you come off there's a crash and that's when people feel kind of tired, crummy, um, and what can we do to help with that? And the second question is about electrolytes, uh, especially if people are lo low in electrolytes, they can also feel tired, so what to do about that? So I'll answer the first question about steroid um, first. Steroid is one of those medications that really give people a lot of energy and improves their appetite and it can actually be helpful to treat pain and nausea. So we talked about how all of these things, these about things can be a part of the fatigue problem. So that's you know, no wonder when people are on steroid, they feel so much better. Um, but the difficulty is in myeloma treatments, a lot of times the steroid it's a really big dose for a short time and then you come off of it right away. So there isn't what we call a taper. Most times in other types of cancer treatments, patients are on the steroid on a lower dose. So when they come off, there's not such a big crash. Or if they're on it, they get tapered off. So it comes down gradually. So I can see why in the myeloma group, it's a very difficult position that you're in. And unfortunately, from the treatment perspective, there's probably nothing you can do about that. Um, I suppose you can speak to the hematologist in that if the crash is so big, is there any way that you can get a bit of a step down in between? So instead of stopping completely, can you do a lower dose for a couple of days just so you get let down a bit more gently? So that's one alternative that you can speak to the hematologist about. The second thing is, you know, as we talked about, being educated about what to expect is helpful. So if you know and you expect that you'll get a crash, you plan for that. So the, the few days, I guess that's where the treatment lock or diary is helpful. If you know your pattern, how long I usually get a crash for and how bad my energy goes down to, then you can avoid things that are too strenuous, uh, avoid doing, overdoing things and, you know, just basically lay low for those few days. So that's one way so that you're not forcing yourself to overexert. You, you book your schedule off. You don't schedule anything that's important. You have to be there for in those times when you feel the worst. Um, and you allow you, yourself the chance to recover gradually. And this is also where that little bit of physical activity, the light to moderate intensity can be helpful. Even when you feel really tired, again, doing anything, any activity counts. So instead of lying in bed for the whole day, even just getting up to the kitchen to get a cup of tea for yourself or coffee, in other people's cases, um, <clears throat> if you do that, that may still be a good enough jump starter to the system to get you going and get out of that rut a bit faster. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and, and because of that, because that's a predictable period where you feel low and it's expected that things will get better after a while, this is also when we would perhaps not recommend additional medication, right? So this is where we wouldn't, we wouldn't give people methylphenidate or the Ritalin. Uh, the second question that you have about uh, deficiency or low electrolytes, um, this is actually an easily fixable problem because anything that's low, and that's why you get blood work routinely when you get on treatment, is so that your team can monitor for those problems, knowing that they do contribute to fatigue. So if there's anything that's low and low enough to a point that they feel this is contributing to the tiredness or other symptoms, then it can be corrected by replacement. Sometimes it's intravenous if it's something that needs to be replaced uh, either because it's so low or that it works a lot faster if you do it intravenously. Other times it could be a pill by mouth. Um, if it's something that seems to happen on a chronic basis and you know it's going to stay low, then maybe uh, you need to go on like a, a pill form so that you take it every day and you keep the level up at a decent amount. The most common deficiency um, patients with cancer have uh, iron, um, but obviously that requires a blood test to confirm. Um, some vitamins like vitamin B, uh, thiamine is one of them, is another one that's commonly low. And then of, of course, all of us who live in this Northern hemisphere, we're usually low in vitamin D and by the nature of our diet, we are usually also low in calcium. So those are things that we can consider replacing. Um, but of course, speaking to your team to talk about your specific numbers and decide together, is it worthwhile to be on a supplement or replacement uh, intravenously? 
So the, the question is, is energy drink a, a good quick fix for that? Right, so the, the uh, supplement to that question is if you, low, if you know that you have low electrolytes uh, and you're actually trying to do physical activity so you can get better energy, would energy drinks be good enough? And I just want to clarify, by energy drinks, do you mean things like Red Bull? Uh, no, more like Gatorade. Okay, so yeah. sports drinks, actually. Sports drinks, like okay. they have, I guess, Right. Chloride. Right. Magnesium. Right. Um, I'm not sure what else. Okay. So um, this is where I think we, we, we should distinguish things a little bit more clearly as well. So energy drinks usually refer to things like Red Bull, right? And those are things that has a bit of a stimulant content, sometimes caffeine in it as well. And those, like how we talked about the caffeine in general, it's probably a quick but very short-lasting fix. And in general, I think we would avoid using energy drinks as a way to get additional energy, especially knowing that the tiredness comes from the cancer is treatment, it tends to be longer lasting, more severe. Energy drinks are not really appropriate. What Jan was referring to is sports drink. So those are special formulation where they have the fluids, they have sugars, they have electrolytes like sodium, et cetera, that your body normally needs in order to function. Um, and that's why athletes use them, right? Because when you sweat, you lose your electrolytes. They are a reasonable thing to have to help maintain your hydration status. Remember, we talked about dehydration can contribute to tiredness. So uh, drinking fluids is always a good idea. Some people find that drinking just plain water can be a little bit too plain, and it really you know, becomes a bit of a chore after a while. So the variety is a good thing. So sports drinks, juice, soups, milk, those are all good um, options or alternatives to have. Sports, uh, sports drinks in themselves are probably not enough to replace a specific deficiency if it's bad enough to show up on your blood test. Let's put it that way. So if your sodium, for example, is so low that it's flagged on your blood test, it's probably not enough to just use sports drinks to replace it. If it's just a little bit low, then it may be helpful. But Usually in those cases, that's not low enough to cause people to feel fatigued. So that's why it's maybe helpful in maintaining your hydration status, but not a good enough fix if your fatigue is actually because of a low or deficient electrolyte. And those situations are where you would actually need either the intravenous replacement because it's a very concentrated formulation, or you take a pill form of that, again, because it's more concentrated and you, the doctors know exactly how much they're giving you to bump up that low number. Um, so yes, that is a common question. In fact, I think I had someone uh, during the break ask me about alcohol. Um, I think alcohol, Depending on how you look at alcohol, alcohol obviously is usually something that we, most people enjoy, right? It improves the quality of life because it, it's something that we use in a social setting a lot of times. So uh, that in itself is not a problem. However, we also should know that alcohol in itself is a depressant, meaning if you consume a, a large amount of it, it actually depresses your mood. And we talked about how mood is a component of tiredness. So if you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're more tired, then we have to keep that in mind, how much alcohol are we consuming? If you're drinking a small amount socially because it gives you a good time and you're out with friends and it actually gives you a boost because you, you feel well being around people you like, doing things you like, I think that's not a problem. The actual amount probably depends on also other medications you may be on because we know alcohol interacts with many medications, specifically things that can make you tired or sleepy. Um, those are things we have to avoid because alcohol has an additive effect, right? So our usual recommendation is one drink, it's probably okay. Uh, but beyond that, it's something you probably need to run by your doctors specifically reviewing the list of medications you're currently on and other things like your, your organ function because we know alcohol goes through your liver so we need to make sure that your liver function is fine as well. Uh, but in general, I think one drink is okay. Uh, obviously, don't drive after you drink, right? That's another given. In terms of cannabis, now this is obviously an area that a lot of people are very interested given what's going on in a few days. Um, there was a question as well during the break about that. Um, Unfortunately, this is an area that is very understudied. There, you know, when we talk about there's not a lot of research for cancer-related fatigue, there is even much, much, much less research in cannabis in general. 
Um, so I think this is my soapbox talk, that cannabis is not something we would recommend as a first or second choice for many things, despite the publicity that's going on right now. Um, I feel like uh, cannabis is something that can be helpful for certain symptoms, perhaps for pain, perhaps for appetite, perhaps for nausea, specifically nausea from chemotherapy. But outside of that context, um, there is really little we know about from research to say cannabis is something we would recommend. Obviously, there are a lot of stories from different people who say cannabis helped them in many ways. It helped with their mood, it helped the sleep. And certainly there are people who, who has a very definite benefit. And for those people, it may be fine for them to use the cannabis. But there are also times where patients tell us the opposite, where it didn't help with their mood. In fact, it made them more anxious or depressed. And it's been known before that can happen. Or other people feel that because it wrapped them up so much, they couldn't really sleep. They're not as relaxed as they were, or they got high. They had that euphoria that prevent them from sleeping or relaxing. So uh, I think just like many medications, how a person reacts to it is very individualized. If it worked out for person A, it doesn't mean that it will work out for person B, uh, and perhaps not in, even in the same degree as well. So this is where I think it's best to talk to your medical team about it. If we're talking about fatigue and sleep in the context of contributing to fatigue, perhaps there is some room to consider using cannabis to help the person's insomnia. If it's something that they've used before and it worked for them, or that we've tried other things that have been better proven by science, and they, those things didn't work on this person, then as a third, fourth, or fifth option, perhaps we would consider cannabis. But other than that, it wouldn't be my go-to. Mm, so the question is, are there any exercise that people should do or avoid on the day they get their blood work? Um, there are no specific recommendations to that regard. Um, in fact, for the recommendations on activity during treatment, um, as I commented earlier on, there isn't enough research to say even how much activity a person should be aiming for while they're on treatment. Um, maybe I should clarify then, uh, Bob, what, what is the concern, for example, in terms of avoiding certain activity on the day of getting blood work? On, on, if your normal routine is, say, to go for an hour of walking or a little bit on an elliptical machine, will that have an effect, say, on your basic blood work or mm. your protein level? So the, the question really comes from, would doing physical activity affect your blood test result? And the short answer is no. So I don't think there's anything you need to avoid on the day of your blood test or your treatment. Um, the only thing I suppose is if you're getting your blood test and your treatment on the same day and you know you're going to get tired afterwards, then you incorporate that into your plan and don't overdo it before you go into your treatment. Because otherwise you're going to get more tired because you've already exerted yourself up front. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a group that comes together from different parts of Canada and I should clarify because that question came up during the break. Um, this is a study where they're looking at uh, research or clinical trials that have already been completed. So they're not looking at recruiting new patients. They're looking at what's been done so far and what worked in myeloma patients or just in general, because I think a lot of the studies were actually not specifically in the myeloma group. So they're trying to extract from the findings of those trials to see what kind of physical activity is actually achievable in cancer patients. And then based on their clinical knowledge of myeloma patients, try to come up with some suggestions or guidelines as we call them on what kind of physiotherapy interventions should be suggested for myeloma patients. So I hope that... Well, I just mean like, yeah. who would we follow up? Yeah, so, so again, in terms of the specific uh, names, I don't have them offhand right now, but it's in one of the references, I think. Um, I'm trying to remember which university they are based out of, and I can't remember right now, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I think, you know, um, in general, it is something that uh, could be helpful you just ask to, to be referred to a physiotherapist to talk about what kind of personalized exercise program I can have. Um, just because 
as I said, for this particular study, because they're looking at all the clinical trials that's been done, and then trying to extract the information, synthesizing it to create a set of guidelines. It will take another one to two years even, uh, if not more than that, to come up with the published, the published guidelines. So uh, I think by that time, it will probably be reported in, in a bit, with a bit more um, uh, publicity. So I'm sure you'll, you'll hear about it one way or another at that point when it's done. But right now, because we don't have that done yet, um, speaking to a physiotherapist within the cancer center that you're being treated at could be helpful. Um, and again, if that particular center has a survivorship program, that's another resource that you can approach, as I mentioned. So the question is around massage, uh, both for while patients are on treatment and for after they finish their treatment. Um, in the guidelines, they had the, the set of guidelines that I was referring to comes from the states, again, from that National Cancer, uh, Comprehensive Cancer Network. And they say there isn't a good amount of research to say whether massage should be done while patients are on treatment. Um, it does seem for some of the trials that have been done, patients find it helpful, and then other times they find it not helpful. But no one had found it made their fatigue or their pain worse. So that's, I guess, the, the silver lining. It's at the worst, it'll just not do anything for you. Uh, but if it's gonna help, that's fine too. That's a bonus for sure. But because of the amount, that's, the amount of research that's been done, it's so limited, they cannot make a recommendation specifically in the guidelines to say, sure, you should go for massage. Every myeloma patient should go for massage. They can't say that yet. So maybe with, again, time and more research, we'll have a more definite recommendation. Right now, it just says it's something to consider, and you can certainly talk to your patients, or you know, as a patient, you can talk to your doctors about it. The, again, only concern is if you have any bony involvement to definitely get the clearance from your doctor or physiotherapist um, to make sure whatever massage treatments they're doing are not uh, do too forceful, uh, too aggressive, that they can actually cause a fracture. For patients who are uh, done with their treatment, so survivors and uh, sort of recovering, the guidelines actually say that it's uh, reasonable to consider massage. But again, it's not a uh, recommendation that's so strong that they say every survivor from myeloma should go get massage because it will do you a lot of good. They can't say that just yet, but that does seem like for people who have finished the treatment, um, they, there's a little bit more positive things to say about massage in general. But the same concern still holds because even if you've completed your treatment, but you have bony uh, issues or fragilities in the, in, the, in the bones, you still have to be careful uh, with the amount or the, the type of force apply. So I would say the same precaution. I think that's a great point made by the story that was shared there at the back, is that sometimes there are chronic non-cancer related health problems that can also contribute to tiredness. Um, hypothyroidism, so low thyroid activity is one of them, right? And being on the medication is important. And if you come off of your medication by accident or whatever reason, that can certainly contribute to fatigue. So um, that's one thing to look out for. And that's when talking to your doctor, just, just review your overall health status to see if there are any other factors that can be contributing that you know, we might have missed in the initial assessment is important. The second point that was made also is there are sometimes deficiencies that no one has thought of checking up until it was brought up. So I think it sort of raises the point of um, self-management and taking charge of your health. I think that's a very empowering statement there, that all of us can be in charge of our health, um, and we should really bring our concerns to our, our healthcare team. As a doctor, I think I would welcome that. And you're right, there are so many things with each person's care, and, and you know, as People have more and more illnesses as they accumulate diseases. Unfortunately, as we live longer, it's harder for, for the doctors and nurses to keep track of every single thing. Um, so I would argue it's a partnership, right? The, the, the patient and their caregiver is one part of this team, as is the doctor, nurses, and all the other therapists and specialists is another part of that team. And together, we can probably achieve the best outcome. Uh, but that also means everyone needs to do their part. So I think it's certainly acceptable and encouraged um, for the patient and the family to bring up concerns. If they think of an idea such as that, like, you know, doctor, what about thiamine? Do you think it could be low? Can we check it? Is it reasonable to check it? That would, 
I would say, stimulate a very good conversation. Um, and that's a great thing. So good, that's, that's a great success story. Thank you for sharing that. So the question is, would a detox uh, be helpful for fatigue? Um, but as you were um, saying, what a detox program is very significantly. And I think this is where it's worthwhile to find out exactly what's involved, uh, what needs to be done in that detox program. Some detox program are simply just trying to eat healthy, um, you know, eating more greens and, and fruits and veg vegetables and maybe having a good sleep schedule and maintaining your bowel health. Those are all good things and certainly can help with your fatigue. But if it's a detox program where it involves a lot of supplements, then you have to pause and, and find out, you know, do I really need these supplements? If there's a deficiency, then maybe it is important to take the supplements, but then the question becomes, what dose of the supplements should I be taking? Uh, is what they're giving me on the detox program adequate to replace the deficiency that's been found? Or is it actually too much? Because there's also a thing known as too much of a good thing, right? At the same time, if the detox program requires you to take other medications or you know, supplements that may interact with your prescription medications or worse, interact with your cancer treatment, with your myeloma treatment, then we have to be very careful. And this is again where it's important to notify your team, like I'm wondering about this detox program and here's what's involved. Do you think that's okay? Um, because we know that certain things like antioxidants can sometimes interfere with your cancer treatment is, is effectiveness. So you do want to double check that this is not the case. And then there are also these interactions with other prescription medications can interact with uh, blood pressure pills, for example, interact with blood sugar pills, um, you know, other things, or thyroid pills, right? So you, you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, you're doing it in a safe way. And then finally, if a detox involves um, enemas and, and flushing the gut, then you also have to think about, uh, would I be overdoing it that I become dehydrated, right? To one of the comments earlier, if I get so dehydrated, then I'm gonna be even more tired. Um, or then if you get so dehydrated that you lose or become deficient on some elect electrolytes, then that can actually be a medical problem. So you don't wanna cr create more medical problems for yourself uh, in that way. And then if it's an enema, for example, uh, you also have to wonder too, is is there an appropriate timing to do that in your treatment cycle? Knowing that anything that you put up your bum can actually increase your chance of infection. So if you're going on your treatment um, and your blood counts will come down, so you have a high risk of infection, you certainly don't want to do anything to yourself that puts yourself at even higher risk of infection. So that is why uh, knowing what's involved in the detox program, what you need to do, what you need to uh, eat or drink, uh, it's important and certainly run it by your healthcare team just to make sure. So certain things are probably okay, other things maybe not so okay, and then something is in between where you need a conversation. So the question is, is there any particular type of food or when you would eat that can worsen fatigue or help with fatigue, I guess, is the other way to look at it. Um, so far, we don't know of any research to say there is one magic food that will make people feel less fatigued uh, or that you know, there is this one evil food you have to avoid because it makes you so much more fatigued. Um, again, I think the key is in moderation. Because if you're able to eat well and stay nourished, then your fatigue will go down. And generally, that means having a uh, very, uh, varied diet. You have different types of good nutritious uh, components to your meal. So proteins and uh, carbohydrates and fats. You know, we do need fats for our body, right? But everything in, in the proper amount. And you want to have a good amount of fiber so that you maintain your bowel health. So that would be the general recommendation. But beyond that, there isn't anything to say, oh, you need to take this specific food, this specific amount. And certainly there's nothing for us right now to say there's a, a best time in the day to eat where you get the most bang for your buck for the food. Um, I think a lot of times when people feel tired, they also unfortunately have this complaint of a poor appetite as well or low interest in food. Um, they tend to go together quite often. So the secret to helping with low appetite is actually eat whenever you want to. So you know, in that case, there's really no set meal times. You wanna have small meals frequently throughout the day because you wanna try and eat as much as you can whenever you want to, whatever you can. Um, so really, I think to tie it back to the fatigue, if 
there are certain times in the day where you're really, really tired. That's probably the time of the day you should avoid eating because you don't want to overexert yourself. But this is where if you keep the diary of your activity, you can plan your day a bit better. When is the best time in the day when I feel the most energetic that I can actually manage a meal fine? Or, you know, if I know that I'm going to get tired within 15 minutes, what are the types of food that I can easily manage within that 15 minutes time frame? And then what are the other types of food that I can use as a nutritious snack for when I have a burst of energy later on in the day that I can just quickly grab so that I keep a decent amount of calories and nutrition in my day and maintain my, my energy and health every day. So, roundabout way of answering, I, but I hope I answered that question. That's a very um, deep uh, thought there, uh, a big point. The question was, you know, what is the association between depression and fatigue? And if we are able to, as a society, destigmatize depression, um, would we be able to treat fatigue better? Um, so to answer the first part of that comment uh, slash question, definitely we know there's a relationship between depression and fatigue, right? Um, in fact, one of uh, the symptoms patients who are depressed have is the, it's tiredness. You know, it could be the physical tiredness, could also be a mental tiredness as well. They just don't have the motivation to do anything and they like to rest all the time. So certainly we know that there is an established relationship. Um, so sometimes if depression is actually the main reason for this person's fatigue, the proper treatment beyond the other things like activity and having a good diet, etc., it's actually treating the depression with the proper medication, so antidepressants. Now, of course, the caveat is many antidepressants has tiredness as a side effect. So that's where um, speaking with your doctor is helpful to find the individual treatment that works well for you. Um, <clears throat> as people's depression improve with the proper treatment, their fatigue will actually also get better. And that's one sign that their treatment is on the right track, in fact, other than obviously their mood getting better. Now, the, the comment about if we destigmatize depression, would it help to treat fatigue? I think uh, it wouldn't be a direct relationship, but it would be an indirect one in that we had talked about how fatigue is usually under-recognized and under-reported. Um, and sometimes, maybe, patients are not reporting fatigue to the team because they are depressed. They don't have the motivation to take charge of their health. They don't have the energy to bring up yet another concern because they, they feel like they're already dealing with too many and it's overwhelming. All that because they don't want to be diagnosed with depression. Maybe they know that you know, the fatigue is part of the depression and they don't want to bring attention to that. Similar to how they don't want to bring attention to the fatigue in case the fatigue is a sign that the cancer is progressing, et cetera, right? So maybe this is an avoidant approach. And if we destigmatize depression and people feel more comfortable talking about a depressed mood, then maybe, yes, it would help with the uh, underreporting issue of fatigue. And if it's found, then we can start working on improving it. So yes, I think indirectly it may help. Um, but that's only one piece of the puzzle because a lot of times people have usually more than one reason or more than one cause for their fatigue. Well, certainly a very um, thought-provoking comment. Um, the question, the comment, I guess, was really about uh, in some cancer centers, they have to fill out this, this distress screening tool called DART. Um, and there are many questions on that screening tool. And part of it was, was actually asking about the tiredness, asking about their mood. and. You know, I think I can totally understand why some people feel that the numbers that get filled out don't translate into meaningful things done to help me as a patient. Uh, and, and that's a totally valid point. Um, unfortunately, there are certainly times where a problem had been reported by a patient or the family and it wasn't attended to. Um, I guess that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that this is a joint partnership in that if this is really uh, a, an issue of your concern, I think it's totally valid and important that you bring it up specifically to say, you know, actually, you know, we haven't talked about my mood, we haven't talked about my tiredness, my fatigue, because it's bothering me. I'm not able to do such and such and such. Um, a lot of times we, we need to understand things in a context. So I think it, it is helpful for the doctors and nurses to be reminded the experience of the patient. 
So if it's something that affects your life, um, it's helpful to, to give some descriptions around it. Like, I'm so tired, I can hardly get out of bed on most days, and on the days that I do, I feel like I have to lie down even after sitting at my desk at the computer for five, ten minutes. Having something concrete like that, I think, really helps us as a healthcare provider to understand how much this is a problem for the person. Um, remember the de definition I showed you in the beginning, it actually talks about fatigue. It's something that affects people's function. And more and more now, in the healthcare circles, there is this call for accountability, that whatever we do, we're doing it to change the outcome or improve the outcome of the patient. And one of the outcomes that we're looking at is the function of the person. Are we getting them back to doing what they want to do, what they need to do? And if we're not, then we're not doing our job. So part of it is maybe because we haven't attended to what's been reported to us, we didn't pay attention to it. Part of it is maybe we didn't understand the context and we need to, to ask about that a bit more from our part, uh, but we certainly welcome reporting actively from the patient's or the family's part. And then finally, maybe also creating ways for us to keep accountable. Like, you know, we, we are asking for those numbers and they go into a big database. I've seen those databases and yes, you, you do get graphs and some of them are look, looking very impressive as well, but what's being done to it? I guess the good news is I just came back, as I, uh, Bob mentioned, one of my interests is quality improvement. So I just came back from a quality improvement conference down in the States and um, one of the, the big topics right now in healthcare is actually looking at that. When we see these reported problems from patients. What are we doing in terms of a health system, in terms of you know, specific things like IT, like how are we making it easy for people to report and what's, doing, what's the system doing to flag it so that we as a doctor would notice, oh wait, this number is actually pretty high or wait, this is reported as a problem. Now we need to attend to it. Um, so I think there is this change in attitude that hopefully we'll get there soon enough that we will attend to all the problems that are raised. Um, so thank you for that reminder. I think that's just an important thing for us to, to, be, to be told. So again, thank you so very much for coming here today. Thank you for having me again.